verses 12 to 15. I'm going to read it. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own de evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Right, from time to time we sing uh, this hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And this is my father's favorite hymn. And when he was converted, you know, um, day by day, he sang this song in the morning, in the afternoon. And this lovely hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, was composed in 1855 by an Irish man called Joseph Scriven. He was born in 1819 in County Town, Ireland, and he was brought up in a uh, prosperous family. His father and mother were uh, rich uh, people. But when he was 24 years old, he had a tragedy in his life. Um, his fiance accidentally drowned in 1843, the night before they were to be married. So one day before their marriage, his fiance uh, accidentally drowned. So he went to Canada and settling in Ontario. And in 1855, he received news from Ireland of his mother being terribly ill. So he wrote a poem to comfort his mother dying. That poem is called Pray Without Seizing. And this poem became the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. He met another lady, and he was due to be married again. But in August 1860, his fiancée suddenly fell ill of pneumonia and died within several days. Then he devoted the rest of his life to tutoring and preaching and helping others. The second verse starts like this, heavy trials and temptations. I think he knew the meanings of trials and temptations in human life. And do you know that Trial and temptation in the book of James come from the same word. It is the same word. The Greek word perasmos can be used for both trial and temptation. Interesting. Because there are similarity. There, there is a similarity between trials and temptations. The similarity is that in both cases, our faith is tested and God wants us to overcome both temptations and trials. However, there are distinctive differences between the two. First of all, their origins are different. Temptations come from internal desires. On the other hand, trials usually come from external matters. So we are tempted by our own desires. If you look at verse 13 uh, in the text, it says, each one is tempted by his own evil desire. So the origins are different. Second one, the purpose of test is different. Trial tests our strength. Trial produces joy, as you know, as James says, trials can produce joy. And because of that joy, we can persevere and endure when we are in trials. And eventually, when we uh, stand firm and endure and persevere in our trials, 
the James says in verse 12, the crown of life will be given to us. So trials bring maturity and joy, and eventually the crown of life in our lives. Uh, recently, uh, a Korean Canadian pastor was released from North Korea. He went to North Korea and he was captured and he spent about two years in a labor camp. Um, he spent a lot of hard time in North Korea. Uh, for example, the authority of North Korea asked him to dig one meter deep pit every day in winter time with one shovel, is it right? Can you imagine you know, the hardness of his labor in winter time? Everything is frozen, minus 10, 20 degrees in North Korea in winter time. So he suffered a lot, and he was released uh, because of the diplomatic relationship between Canada and North Korea. So he came back to his family and his church, and the following Sunday, he preached a sermon. In that, he said, I didn't know about this one, but through my suffering and trials in North Korea for two years in the labor camp, I realized this one. Trials in Christian life is the third sacrament after baptism and the Holy Communion. That was what he said in his sermon. Trials in Christian life is the third sacrament um, St. Augustine, he defined a sacrament in this way. A sacrament is a um, visible sign of an invisible grace of God. John Wesley, he said, a sacrament is a means of grace of God. So from that understanding, think about what the pastor Im says in his sermon. Suffering. Trial is a sacrament. It's a kind of visible sign of an invisible grace in our lives, suffering. It can bring maturity, it can bring um, joy. And when we persevere in our sufferings, God is going to give us the crown of life. But temptation usually attacks a weak and vulnerable spot in our lives. Temptation causes us to sin, which may lead us to spiritual death when sin is full grown in our lives. So temptations may bring death, spiritual death, and we do not spiritually die immediately after we sin. No, no. But when we do not deal with sin in repentance, it grows fully and we become spiritually dead. If you read the, the Old Testament, you find this. The northern Israel and southern Judah, they were destroyed, and they were punished by God, and they were exiled. And what was the reason? Superficially, we can say that it is because of their sin, it is because of their disobedience, they were destroyed and they were exiled. That's right. But fundamentally, it is because that they did not repent their sins. They did not return to God. They neglected their sins to grow fully. And then God intervened into the situation and God punished. Sin, sin itself does not bring spiritual death. It is our negligence. It is our attitude of negligence. Just we leave it there and we do not deal with it. So the sin grows fully, and then we are dead spiritually. Temptation destroys our spiritual life and our relationship with God when we fail to overcome it. Therefore, Christians, we have to deal with our temptations effectively if we have true faith that James speaks in his book. If we have a true faith, then we have to handle temptations in our lives. And how can we handle temptations properly, effectively, and biblically? One day, you know, Cain was very much angry because his sacrifice was not accepted. So he was angry, and he thought, I'm going to kill my brother. He thought about it. And at that moment, God came to him and said, 
Cain, sin is crouching at your door, and it desires to have you, but you must master it. Sin that is mentioned in the verse is not the sin that he has committed. He hasn't committed yet, so it's a kind of potential sin that he hasn't committed. There is a possibility that he may commit. So it's a temptation. So Cain, think, temptation that you want to kill your brother is crouching at your door, and it has got desire to swallow you, but you have to master it now. You have to master. And how can we master temptations in our lives? And we have to understand that there are two different levels of temptations from my Christian understanding. One is that some temptations are noticeable and tangible. Because when they come to us, we immediately know that we are tempted. Because when we are tempted, our inner desires are stimulated, whatever it is. And this is obvious evidence that we are tempted. It seems that we are tempted by a particular situation or circumstance, but the Bible says actually we are tempted by our inner desire. For example, there is a lady who was addicted to chocolate, so she made her mind up, I do not want to eat chocolate any longer. One day she was driving her car, passing by a huge supermarket. She was driving her car to that car park. And she thought, okay, I parked my car here, but I do not go into the supermarket. She opened the car door, and she was entering into the supermarket, thinking, okay, I go into the supermarket, but I do only for my grocery shopping. I do not go to the chocolate section but she found that she was standing in front of the chocolate section. <laughs> okay, I touch it, but I do not buy. But actually she found that in her, one chocolate bar was in her shopping basket. Okay, I bring it to the till, but I do not pay. But she paid for it, thinking, okay, I buy, but I do not eat it. When she got to her car, she opened the car door, sat down, opened it, thinking, I opened it, but I do not eat it. But she bite one and said, wow, what a wonderful. <coughs> there are two biblical tactics to handle uh, noticeable and tangible temptations. The first one is very easy. I think you have heard it numerously in different places. The first one, the first tactic is to fight. We have to fight. Don't just accept it. Fight. The Bible says we have to fight the good fights. And fighting temptation is one of the good fights. We have to fight. Do you know if we do not fight and just accept temptation, what will happen? I, would, I, want, I want to give you one good example. Think about Samson. He was tempted. He knew about you know, that symptom in his life. He was being tempted. He knew about it, but he went there. He didn't fight. He didn't fight. He allowed the temptation to come into his life, and he exposed himself in a dangerous situation. It was he, because he loved the lady. So what happened? His hair, the symbol of power, the symbol of God's love, the symbol of God's presence, the hair, his hair was shaved. What a shame. And you know, his two eyes were gouged out, and he became a slave of his enemies. Shameful life. If we do not fight, temptations that we have in our lives, we may be like Samson. And what is the weapon to fight temptation? The Bible says the Word of God. It's very simple, isn't it? The truth is very simple. What is the weapon to fight against 
temptations that we have in our lives? The Word of God. Think about Jesus, how he overcame and fought temptations, temptations that he had in the wilderness. He responded to the temptations with the words that he knew he had in his mind. Memorizing Bible verses is really important to discern different types of temptations and to fight immediately. Jesus didn't say, Satan, I think I can find one verse to fight against that temptation. Let me go to the temple and find the verse from the scroll. <laughs> He didn't say it. He reputed and responded with the words that he had in his mind. Memorizing verses is really important. Memorize. Steve and I, we went to an uh, elders conference years ago. I think it was eight, nine years ago. Um, the topic on that day was temptation. Temptation. And one of the serious uh, discussions was that how can we as elders uh, and leaders in, in, in churches, how can we help our congregation to overcome different types of temptations? And that was the topic. It was very useful for me as a young pastor to know you know, different tactics and strategies and you know, methods to help our congregations to overcome different types of temptations. So there were so many ideas. We have to do this one. We have to do that one. And then one um, old man, he stood up and said, from my long-term uh, church leading experience, there is only one way to help our congregation to overcome their different types of temptations in their lives. And everybody opened their ears. What is that? What is that? He said, feed your congregation with the word of God. If they are full of the word of God, they are not tempted to take the bite, bait, I mean, to take the bait. They do not bite the bait which has got hook inside. If they are full of the word of God, it's the same, isn't it? When we have full of food in our stomach, we don't have any appetite any longer. So, the Word of God, reading, studying, memorizing the Word of God is the most important weapon with which we can fight temptations in our lives. First one, fight. Fight. Whatever it is, fight. Don't just accept it. Second one, flight. <laughs> flight. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, Temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, He will show you a way out. So the Bible says that when we are tempted, there is a way out all the time. Flee from what you are being tempted, whatever it is. Internet or whatever it is, just flee from what you are being tempted. And run away from a situation or circumstance that you are tempted in. Think about Joseph. What is the difference between Joseph and David when they were tempted by one particular woman? Joseph, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he didn't have long Bible study. Potiphar, come here. This is the word of God. And God is looking at us now. It's not right. He didn't spend time. Immediately, he said, it's not right. And then he left. He ran out, ran away from the site. I think that was really wise. He flew from the side, from the situation, from the uh, circumstance. But David, with his power as a king, he was drawn into the situation continually. Bring, who is that uh, lady? You know, who is a husband? And bring her here. And eventually he committed adultery. Run away. 
from the situation that you are tempted. And second level temptation is that some temptations are subtle. I, I cannot find any better words because of my limitation of English. Subtle. Some temptations are subtle. And this is my main focus that I want to bring actually this morning. Um, John Paul Sartre, um, the philosopher uh, from France, he said, life is C between B and D. Have you heard about it? Life is C between B and D. It means life is choice between birth and death. Interesting statement. We make a lot of choices while we are living on earth. And when we make choices, we have a tendency as a human being not to go against common sense. This is good. It is needed actually. In other words, we want to make rational decisions all the time. It's not bad, it is good, we have to do. Uh, and this is okay to people in the world, but sometimes it may be against God's will. And this is the point that I want to bring today. Think about it. Decisions that we make according to common sense and rationality that we have in our community, in our culture, maybe, maybe against God's will and God's plan. What is common sense? What is rationality? It is good sense and sound judgment in practical matters. And Cambridge Dictionary defined common sense in this way. Common sense is the basic level of practical knowledge and judgment that we all need to help us to live in a reasonable and safe way. So common sense is practical knowledge accumulated in our society, in our culture, that governs our thought and behavior. From this understanding, I want to say this one. There is a dangerous trap in common sense that Christians may be caught in. It's a temptation. It's a temptation. Christians, we are tempted to make our decisions all the time according to common sense, rationality. The tragedy is that you know, people depend on the results of surveys, scientific experiment, and thesis, and opinions of professional people more than the world of God nowadays. It's a tragedy. And there is a dangerous trap in common sense, as I said. Example, political correctness is part of common sense nowadays. But we already know that political correctness in our days is against God's word. It is against God's word. We know that killing somebody is wrong according to the Bible and also according to you know, common sense that we have in our society. But sometimes God says kill. God says kill. Where it is? Think about the war that Joshua and his people had when they conquered Canaan. Do not leave anything which has got life in the land. Just, just destroy them. This was what God said. If Joshua was full of common sense, Lord, that's not right. They are precious people. They were created by you. Give them a chance to repent. This is what common sense does nowadays. Dangerous. Isaiah, he criticized the politicians and kings of Judah. Why? Because the kings and politicians in Judah, they tried to build their diplomatic relationship with the countries around Israel in order to keep peace in the country. When Egypt was stronger, then Assyria, Judah, they paid tribute to Egypt to have relationship. In that way, they could have peace in the country. 
When Assyria was stronger than Egypt, they went to Assyria paying tribute to the country. In that way, they tried to manage peace in the country. And God said, that's not right. That's not right. Maybe you, you think that that kind of diplomatic relationship is a wise thing and absolutely good thing in your common sense to bring peace, to keep peace in your country. But from my, from my viewpoint, that's not right. I'm the king over your country. I'm the king in your country. Think, if we read the Old Testament, they have never been strong enough to fight against their enemies. It was God. It was God who protected the country from their enemies all the time. It was God who brought peace to the country. But now, with common sense or in terms of making wise decisions, they try to build their diplomatic relationship. They depend on countries, stronger countries than God. The Bible is full of examples that God commanded his people to go against common sense. Think about Noah. Noah, go to the mountainside and build a ark, an ark, which is similar size to a football stadium nowadays. Is it right according to common sense that people had at that time? No. No at all. Abraham, God asked him to leave his country, his people, his family, and ask him to go somewhere that God was going to indicate. Well, Lord, just take your step now. God asked him to offer his son Isaac to him as a sacrifice. Is it, is it reasonable? Is it, is it right according to common sense? Joshua, God asked him, Joshua, stand firm and listen to what I'm saying to you. You don't have any kind of weapons or strategies to demolish this uh, castle of Jericho. Just march around it once a day and on the seventh day, seven times. Lord, this city is well fortified. They are far taller than myself. They have got better weapons. Marching around the city, once a day and seven times on the seventh day, is it reasonable, Lord? But he didn't say that. He obeyed. Gideon, when the Midianites came upon the country to fight, Gideon summoned you know, the men in the country. So as you know, 33,000 men came along and they were ready to fight. But God said, most of you should go back home. Only 300 people were left. Do you know how many were the Midianites' army? How many? 1,000. 135,000 soldiers. How many times? 450 times more than the Israelites, 300 people. Is it reasonable to fight against you know, an army which has got 450 times more soldiers than this is a small group of people. Is it reasonable? It's not. It's not. All these are nonsense. But they were not tempted by common sense whispering to their eyes, it's not going to work. Abraham, Noah, Joshua, Gideon, listen, it's not going to work. That is the whispering of common sense. And I hear that every day. Alex, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's nonsense. And it's a big temptation in my life. I'm not tempted by any kind of things. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm not, I shouldn't be boasted of. <laughs> I'm tempted, but this, the most serious and powerful temptation is this kind of whispering in my, uh, in my ears. Is it going to work? No, no. But they obeyed God, and they could see how God worked in their lives. They could see. When they obeyed, they could see eventually how God is powerful, was powerful in their lives. Temptation by common sense 
is the greatest enemy to this contemporary Christianity, I think. Churches and Christians seek sustainability and maintenance, but they lack a spiritual, um, a, a spirit of adventure with God. I have never seen a church getting mortgage or loan from the bank to the God's mission. We are we, we just we lack of a spirit of adventure nowadays. We want to do everything in a manageable life, manageable way. That's it. Jesus said, Can I find faith when I return? And what is faith? What is faith? The faith from my um, understanding and through preparing this sermon. Faith can be defined in this way. Faith is the high level or highest level of de dependence on God. What is unbelief then? Unbelief is the high level of dependence on common sense and rationality. Do you know when the level of dependence on God was high you know, in the history of Israel? When it, it, it was when they um, lived in the wilderness after Exodus. That was a time that their dependence, their level of dependence on God was high, very high. In a sense, when they lived nomadic life in the wilderness, they depended on God most. Nomadic lifestyle. Why? Because if you live a nomadic lifestyle without a house, if you travel from one place to another place, you need three things. And I have learned this, this, these three things since I left Korea. The first one, providence. Providence. Second one, protection. Third one, guidance. Three things are needed when they lived in the wilderness. In a, in, a, in a nomadic lifestyle. But actually God provided things they needed through manna and quails. Can you imagine the clothes that they, they wore when they came out of Egypt? They still wore the clothes for 40 years. Can you imagine how can you wear your clothes for 40 years? They wore the same sandals for 40 years. Can you imagine? God provided. They learned it. So in that way, their level of dependence was high. God guided them with the pillars of fire and cloud. And God protected them from enemies. When they camped in different places, when they marched from one place to another place, God protected them. They didn't have any attack from their enemies at all for 40 years. So when they lived nomadic lifestyle, their dependence, the level of dependence was high. When this high level of dependence on God began to be decreased, when they settled down, when they came into Canaan and when they settled down in the agricultural society, they sowed the seeds in spring, and they reaped harvest in autumn. They worked hard, and they ate food product of their labor. Self-sufficient. That is dangerous. They began to depend on their own life skills and strength and power. They began to forget God who brought them out of Egypt. So several times God spoke to them, I am God who brought you out of Egypt. Do not forget me. Do you know why God asked them to, uh, to do the sacrifices and uh, to keep you know, the festivals? Through those things, God wanted them to remember who, God, who their God was through sacrifices and through festivals. But they forget God. And they began to worship other gods. This phenomenon is seen in this contemporary Christianity in this country, in UK. Economic prosperity pushed God away. People are self-sufficient. And they do not need God. 
And we have got you know, one beautiful family from Uganda. And in, in some part of Africa still, people, they, had to, they have to walk two, three hours to go to their church. Is it right? And I, I saw a film, you know, on the way to church, they dance. And they have worship for three hours. Can you imagine? Three hours, three hours walking to the church and three hours worshiping. They do not sit like, like a sit back. They do not complain about their hard chairs. They stand and sing. And they, they come back to their home for walking three hours again. They are happy. They are happy. Do you know why? God is their provider. If God is not there in their lives, they don't have anything to eat on their table next day. But they know that God provides. God is their provider. God is their sustainer. And God is their healer. They don't have doctors. When they come to church, God heals. What a wonderful. So I think it is better not to have many or much in our lives. This subtle temptation tries to remove God in our society, even in the church. Even in the church. What can we do? I will finish this soon. What can we do? King Darius issued a decree that anyone who prayed for, uh, for a month to any god would be thrown into the lion's den. That was the decree. And Daniel heard it. And he had a subtle temptation not to pray for 30 days. But you know what he had done. He came back home and he prayed, opened the windows toward heaven, towards Jerusalem, and he sat down and knelt down before uh, the Lord and he prayed three times a day with the thanksgiving. What does common sense say in this kind of situation? Daniel, be reasonable. It's just a month that you do not pray. Just a month. Just keep your mouth. Be reasonable. You are an important person, not only for this kingdom, but also for the kingdom of God. You have to survive in this trial. It's not temptation, it's trial to survive. Don't pray for a month. Daniel, think about it. You have been praying, praying, praying for your entire life, even three times a day. Just you can take one month as your sabbatical period. Be reasonable. Be reasonable. That is what common sense says to us, whispers to us. It's okay, Daniel, in the end. God can understand you. But Daniel overcame this subtle temptation. As I said, he went back home, opened the window toward Jerusalem, knelt down, prayed three times a day with thanksgiving. He knew, Daniel knew, what the best was for God, not for him. And this is the conclusion. He knew what was the best for God, not for him. The so subtle temptations say that, think about what is best for your life, Alex. What is the best for you, for your family, for your situation? That is a temptation whispering to us. But true faith that James speaks now tells us, Alex, refuse it. Think about what is the best for God. What is the best for God? Churches, we have to make decisions. In this way, what is the best for our church? No. What is the best for God? Not for me, for the church, for the community, but for God. This is the only way, this is the only way that we can overcome these subtle temptations that we are facing in this contemporary era. What was the best for Daniel? Keeping his life through not praying for a month. But what was the best for God in that situation? He thought, God must be glorified, whether he is alive or he's dead. 
thinking what is the best for God is the best way to overcome subtle temptations. While I was preparing this sermon, I thought about Jesus Christ. He was on the cross, and some people shouted, If you are the Son of God, come down. Prove yourself that you are the Son of God. Show us your power. And that is a kind of subtle temptation that he was facing. But he endured. He endured. Why? He knew. Jesus knew what was the best for the Father. So he endured on the cross. All the faithful people in the Bible, they thought only one thing. What is the best for God? Forgetting anything in his life, in their lives. Let's think what is the best for God who called us, who saved us, who is with us, and who will give us the eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, we pray to give us wisdom to discern what is the best for you, Lord. Lord, forgive us, Lord, because we have been chasing the things that seem to be best in our lives. But Lord, from now on, we want to pursue the thing that is best for you, Lord. That is the attitude that we have to show and have as your servants. Lord, lead us and guide us to fulfill your plan, your will in this place. We want to glorify your name, only your name, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.